Bienvenue, welcome. <laughs> we have wonderful acoustics, we have wonderful weather, we have a wonderful congregation. Uh, all of you, of course, are very welcome to the inaugural Love Poetry Festival in honor of Milk Maycor and Woodland McEwen. And, and I'll just mention very quickly how this all came about. But also, before I even get started, I want to thank Michelle Alfano, who's really been uh, being a super, 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 super all around organizer extraordinaire for getting this all together and bringing us here. And I'll just mention quickly, uh, this actually, this whole project started about a year ago, uh, late August actually, uh, 2015, in that uh, when I was a, a poet laureate for the city of Toronto, I was successful, or I should say we were successful in allowing or suggesting to Heritage Toronto that a plaque be put up on the island in honor of Milton A. Corn and Woodland McEwen because uh, during their brief marriage uh, in 1962, they lived here. Uh, I think it was Milton Acorn's choice uh, for the most part, keep in mind that Gwendolyn McEwen was from Toronto, born and raised, uh, so the island probably was not, not, probably not all that mysterious to her, but nevertheless, he, coming from Prince Edward Island, really wanted to be on the island. Uh, so they were here, spent a winter here, I guess part of the spring. It's uh, Ward's Island, uh, the address, uh, their home no longer exists. It was destroyed by fire in the 1980s, but it was number 10, Second Avenue. If you choose to wander over there, or if you just want to go take a look at the plaque, the plaque is at the entrance or the end of Second Avenue. And don't worry, the, the, the street is very short. It's a very short street. It takes you two minutes to walk one end to the other. So don't think you have to walk a really long ways to see that plaque or find that plaque. But when we did the unveiling ceremony, uh, last August, uh, 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 I just had the, the idea that we should have a love poetry festival, and why not? And, and being a poet, of course, my sensibility is ironic. It's an ironic sensibility, uh, and, and, and uh, I, I, I accent the irony by saying, uh, by mentioning the fact that Gwendolyn McEwen and Milton Acorn did not stay married for very long. Uh, it was only, uh, they were married in 62, uh, the marriage effectively lasted as a real marriage only a few months. And, and uh, when Gwendolyn left uh, in the summer of 62 to go to Egypt, that was her basically leaving the marriage. Uh, they weren't officially divorced until 1966, so I hope that you'll appreciate the beautiful irony here of having a love poetry festival uh, honoring two great poets from the 1960s, uh, uh, names that are canonical in Canadian poetry, English Canadian poetry, and at the same time, uh, they didn't remain married, but I'm sure that their love continued, uh, uh, at least in, in uh, uh, perhaps subterranean or ethereal or, or, or uh, astral plane uh, types of, of existence. Uh, in any event, uh, that story is basically the inception of, of, of this festival. And then uh, uh, I mentioned to Michelle uh, that she might think about putting together such a festival. Uh, given the success of the not so nice Italian girls uh, reading series, uh, with that with that brilliant title uh, and, and so on, and and uh, and she was of course uh, immediately uh, very pleased to think about that possibility. And then we made the pilgrimage to Ward Island. It was it was in March, wasn't it? But it was still a cold day. It was still a very cold day. Anyway, we came over here and 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 looked at the church and fell in love with it immediately, I'm sure all of you have, if you haven't been here before, I mean, this is a brilliant structure, an absolutely incredible place, and you can tell from my voice already that the acoustics here are extremely uh, welcoming and resonant, resonant, no pun intended, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, through my context, the Library of Parliament, uh, they agreed that they, that they would rent uh, the church for today, for this purpose. The church, of course, agreed that we might use it for this purpose today. And, and then uh, put us in touch with the wonderful organist uh, as well. Pianist. Yes. Pianist. Uh, sorry, pianist, excuse me. I, I have, I'm wearing bifocals, everybody. I just want to explain that. So let me blame it on the bifocals. The wonderful pianist, uh, who's the serenading us, and will be playing a little bit later on as, as well. 
Uh, and so that's the genesis of this. We hope that this is the first and that it will go on and on and on, and that you come back next year. We'll do this again next year and have uh, more poets involved and fill the church with poetry lovers and, and lovers, period, and, and poets, period, whether they're lovers or not. Some may not be. Uh, in that case, then they probably shouldn't be here. But all that to one side, never mind. I shouldn't start preaching that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> just let me say, uh, uh, I should mention that it's Roger Sharp as a, a pianist. Uh, in fact, let's get a round of applause, please, for Mr. Sharp. <laughs> uh, and and now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, the most extraordinary uh, organizer of FET involving poets and poetry in the entire GTA, and on the entire GTA from Mississauga on the west, a shout out to Pearson Airport, all the way over to Scarborough on the east, and from the lakeshore, the beaches, the Queensway, all the way north to... Uh, <laughs> one of those uh, suburban uh, uh, villages up there. Where's the uh, Twillingbury? Twilling, isn't Twillingbury? All right, uh, Woodbridge. Was that Woodbridge? Uh, Michelle Alfano. Uh, I want to introduce to you now, who served as an associate editor with the Literary Quarterly Desk Camp until 2015. Her novella, Made Up of Areas, was the winner of the Brassani Award for Short Fiction. Her short story, Opera, was a finalist for a Journey Prize anthology. Her fiction and nonfiction work has been widely published in Canada in major literary publications. She is currently at work on two projects, a personal memoir entitled the Unfinished Dollhouse, to be published by Cormorant Books in 2017, and the novel Destiny, Think of Me While You Sleep. Michelle. The ignorant ships kiss and pass. Love, we have learned nothing. We have learned nothing. Not in the slated nights, not in the chalkboard cities. Jesus, Nietzsche, call them and they will not come for you. Though your hair is on fire from the brain beneath it burning. Love, we have learned nothing. We have learned nothing, not on the gold islands, not on the washed beaches. We were two ships of burning glass. We were two ships of burning glass. Now, in our distorted distances, the ignorant ships kiss and pass. Two. Endangered you, the strokes of the sun were lashes to your lips, your brow, beauty burning in the fires of your room. Ah, what do I speak? I with pencils. What do I speak? 
who love you, under fire and churches, in snow, in rain light, ever behind the seasons. Sunday, somewhere you were, red and gold on beaches, disturbed with gulls and steamers. Monday, somewhere you were, gay among ruins, old stone, the fake architecture of Kingsmere. Dancing, the colors were. Fall, the colors fell. Into your hair, into your brow, etc. Ah, who am I with pencils? Who love you? Behind reason, behind the poem, even behind the seasons, defining as the poem pillages reasons. You who defy the reasons of poetry. You endangered by your own images. Three. Your hand on my left breast, perhaps. Or the ankles staying. The genitals like tears. Your eyes wide with fear. The attack. Lions. The lean loins of them. We were ships. We were lions. We were delicate with our images. We were a man in a blind man's vision, and our name was Adam, and we had no home. Always, always your face was moving. Before the ships, before the buildings, a crescent leaning, the conscience of the flesh. Now it is winter. He, heed, I say. Heed the speech of your hands. Feet, feet, I say. Move swiftly. Leave no track. Thanks. Wow. I guess I have to follow that up with my own stuff now. Um, so what I'd like to offer you in terms of uh, my own material is a kind of a three-part poem as well, but it's actually three poems that are just sort of put together. Um, and they're put together in the form of a reverse love story. Uh, I thought that'd be fun. Um, so we're gonna start with, uh, on the depressing side, with divorce and the breakup. It, it gets better, I swear. Um, <laughs> then we'll move on to the sort of time when the couple's together, um, the marriage, if you will, and then we'll end off with courtship. So we'll see how that works. Uh, even though they're three different poems, I'll just forget the titles and we'll just try to make it one story. When I stopped praying, I started falling hopelessly in love with people. It happened with you when we went out for drinks on my birthday less than a month after we met. Again, when you said, you can sleep on the couch, or you can come downstairs with me. And again, when you let me chop half a box of mushrooms before kicking me out of your kitchen with affection, no longer strategically positioned like a Super Mario mushroom life. I could not tell that I was infatuated to the point of catfishing myself by how committed you seemed while test driving me. Which, as the cold existentialist that I am, would have been fine. Except you never showed your hand until I asked if we were more than friends, like a Marina Abramovich full body naked smack into movable columns. When you said no and returned me after your no commitment free trial, you didn't even liberate me by obliterating me with your rejection. Instead, you said, Right now, you were focusing on being an audience to every experience. I hope you enjoyed the show. So we'll move on to the marriage part. And it's actually in the form of wedding vows, so this is kind of appropriate. Uh, so let's give it a shot. Baby, 
You remind me of the glass tray in my microwave no one's able to line up with the plastic ring beneath it. <laughs> Insults slide off you to the sound of a cannon fire. I decided to stick around forever when, from the bathroom at 3 a.m., you woke me up to say the dirt in your hair is a shade of strawberry I can't see. Because we've yet to kiss under a lamppost mistletoe to retrofit my eyes with fresh lenses. When I asked who your eye doctor was, you said, chill, baby, you're covered under my health plan. <laughs> we hover our hands under each other's bellies to catch the extra baggage beneath our eyes. We are swaddled in the certainty that those bags were almost empty when we met. So we press the backs of cold spoons on them to turn them a lighter shade of black. I vow to be saved when you dance like a preacher's last hallelujah. I vow to cherish your version of jeans and a t-shirt because there are only sundresses in it. I promise to never ask you to smile when you are sad or laugh when you are angry. When you told me that as a kid, your mother convinced you that wearing red shirts helps get rid of colds because of the way light refracted through red fabric collides with skin. I forgot that I hated physics in high school and saved all my red threads for my sniffliest of days. I swooned when you said you only watched minor motion pictures. When I was a kid, I felt sorry for CDs. I didn't listen to that often. I knew we'd go good together. <laughs> All right, so we're at the beginning of this love story, this reverse love story, which is the end. Um, so this is like the courtship, when they're just sort of trying to establish who they are as a couple. Um, let's see how it goes. <clears throat> On the train ride home, after a good dinner, she asked me about us. She asked me, where are we going? And I said, love, awkward is my direction. As in, no, I don't feel like I belong here, but it's how I know I'm supposed to be here. As in, I overthink that which requires no thought, like I am here sitting next to you, and the way your lip curls when you smile makes me feel indestructible. As in the unlit hallway we call future is all haunted house giggles when you straighten my collar. As in uncertainty is the memory of ocean air in the dead of winter when you spider your fingers down my face. As in I will love you until I can't unlearn you without becoming someone else. Because it is now news to me when people die. As in unsettle me. I am open to your suggestions, rip my roots from all that I hold to be true. As in my bedroom is a packed suitcase, a testament to how I never really moved out of my last apartment, my grip can be stubborn like that. As in sometimes I ask all the questions. As in I will knock on your imaginary walls, shells, and bubbles because a great love, like a great work of art, isn't shaped once over time. It is the last canvas after a studio full of failed attempts. As in, I would rather learn from you and call you my greatest face plant than not know you at all. As in, I have been a lover's last resort, third choice, second chance, first draft. This is my stop. Which way are you headed? Thank you so much, guys. Wow.
And I just want you to make that public. Um, I want to thank Trevor for testifying, testifying so beautifully to the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the, the thrills, the chills, the, 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 the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat as in the wide world of sports uh, telecast from a few decades ago. Uh, wonderful work, great. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, and and uh, it's time to introduce Karen Mahal, but before I do that, I want to ask uh, uh, Honey Novik to stand and give a testimonial. Uh, uh, Yes, please do. So what George is alluding to, when they just left Liz, Lizzo, and Alice um, in the winter after, um, or after, whenever, when we were trying to organize this event and to make George's dream a reality, um, I called Liz, who lives on the island. Liz is a former city Toronto councillor with much roots, and she contacted the church. And through Liz and Joyce Rogers, we were able to help uh, George make his dream come true. Uh, thank you so much, honey. I'm sorry that you missed saying that before they left. Uh, but uh, it's the spirit, the spirit of gratitude is here. Yeah, we are embodying it and expressing it, all of us, right now. So thank you so much for that, for that note. Uh, it is my great pleasure now to introduce Karen Mulholland. Uh, who is someone who has been associated with the Toronto Islands, for crying out loud. Her new book of poems, Seasons in the Key of J, will be published in spring 2017 by Tight Rope Books. Her most recent book of poetry is The Code Orange in Blazing Sweet from Black Moss Press 2015. Code Orange was published in English and in French with translations into French by Nancy Houston. It was launched in Toronto and in Paris. No, no, I said Paris, not to be confused with Paris, Ontario. I mean Paris, the Republic of France, where it was also launched in the fall of 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Mohammed. Michelle contacted me. I knew Milton when I was a graduate student at U of T. He was part of a big movement called the Canadian Liberation Movement. And Gwen and I were friends. In fact, we published her in Desk Hand over more than a decade. And she also read for us at the final Canadian Forum Benefit just before her death, a couple months before her death. So over the last few months, I've been rereading all of their work and I've been marveling at what I had forgotten. I had forgotten how fantastic they are at their experimenting, at their passion, at their skills in general. Um, and like all poets, they wrote scores and scores of love poems. So it was very hard to choose a poem or two to read today because there were just so many. And we're going to hear later Milton's endless performance and augmentation of a poem called I Shout Love. And it'll go on like that. <laughs> Robert's going to do that wonderfully. So they're very different poets, but they're both major figures, and I'm really honored to be able to help celebrate them today. In her note to A Breakfast for Barbarians, Gwen says that she writes to communicate passion, mystery, and joy. I think we could argue that all of Gwen's poems are love poems, including her masterpiece, the T.E. Lawrence poems, which I think are the ineffables of the world. So I'm going to read two poems from Gwen's book, Afterworlds, 1987, which is the year of her death. First day night. I don't trust you for a single second, but my bones turn gold in your hands, warm holding, in the dark, or in the bright heart of the morning. And suddenly the days are longer than anything, longer than Tolstoy, longer than Proust, longer than anything. But the days are also diving into night, and I told you, our end lay in our beginning, so we drink to our end, always remembering that at the bottom of the goblet of Pompeii was the skull. We crawl out of the night, utterly broken, bruises all over our souls, 
but this pain returns me to the world. Even in the end, your perfidy serves me. So the cry we made when we came, love, will sound the same and is the same as the cry we will make when we go. Another one from Afterworlds, November. If you knew that I would lie here on this dark November morn, considering nothing but your eyes, your eyes, would you laugh with disbelief, surprise, remembering how we spoke of calculus and stars and ruined civilizations and world powers and their stupid chess games and unwon wars and how the innocence of this land may lie not in what we think is weakness but in strength. What would they have called us if they thought they'd found China instead of India? Mandarins, Mongols, chinks? And how at the end of the evening celestial tea was served and I looked into your eyes, your eyes, and considered abandoning politics and poetry for the dark spirits and slices of your body as subtle and alien and intimate and known to me as you are, who are able, as all multiple and perfect equations are, to bend and break my mind. I loved you, so sue me. A dozen stars went nova just like that. <laughs> When I was married, I lived on Ward's Island, um, only two streets away from where Gwen and Milton briefly, very briefly, once lived. Then my first book of poems was called She Ben Solomon and came out of the island and my life immediately after. And it was about the great love affair between the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. Sheba and Solomon. Arm bound, bonded they stand, bone on bone, warm breath circling nostril. And then they are, cloud and fire, queen and king, old, newborn, the one, the always. Wrapped in a motion of frenzy, the king marches, strides east, strides west, sees his world, and returns to find her singing evokes him, calls him forth prepotent to the one who stands now before him. They meet then decorously, history appointed, prepotent velvet to velvet, woman and man, human motion, acting out what has always been, bright horse, bright rider. My next book of poems was called Modern Love, as I said, poets write poems about love all the time, so here are two from Modern Love. Spell against the author of Spell Against Love Poems. If I begin to write this poem to say I loved you, that I felt the world around me, infused by you, your bright stratagems in a perpetual night. It will be to admit that I begin to evade your stratagems, that the perpetual night is passing, that all companionship of the mind is evanescence or trick of the body, hot temporary clouds that make the light of loneliness more intense, soon, inevitably. So I write this spell against the speller. I keep silent, evade you here in the night, where my mind is, and not in the body, losing itself to darkness and dreams, to the writing of love poems. I loved you with so bright a light, so wise, I could not write. Mm -hmm. Second one from Modern Love. On clarity in the crystalline structure. By night you enter me, we travel together. The years open up before us. We garden by starlight, eat breakfast with the moon, take long walks, hand in hand, in the darkness. Waking each morning, I lose you again, attempt to anesthetize that loss, bury myself in the report on business. Today, designer ice from northern BC, glaciers may make a splash in California coolers. I want that ice age ice. I want to return to salmon BC. I want to reaffirm my connection with the glacier. But each night, the meltdown occurs. I can no more turn you off than imagine the end of Salmon Glacier, centuries of pressurization, freed from impurities. Unlike the Salmon Glacier, our life is not a renewable resource. Like the Salmon Glacier, the environmental impact is nil. Unlike the Salmon Glacier, the advertising potential is not fabulous. Gourmet ice, still calving. Next year, as George said, I have a new book coming up from Tightrope, and I thought I'd read a very short poem from that book. It's called Sub Rosa, from Seasons in the Key of J. When I think of the rose, not Sub Rosa, secretly, and not of Dioni, 
female generative principle, for you are mainly male, though your nipples might suggest other sources of the self. When I think of the roses on Roman banquet hall ceilings, the reminder that things said under the influence, sub vino, should always be sub rosa. When I think of the dream of you entering me, sub rosa, from behind, like the five-petaled rose carved into the confessional, promising that all that was said should be undisclosed, like a secret brotherhood, a secret sisterhood, where affairs of state are always sub rosa. As the anus opens sub rosa for your entry, I remain sub rosa for your passage to the deepest confidence we share covertly as Aphrodite opens to Eros her rose. I'm just going to read one last poem by Gwen. I thought she should have my last word. This one's called You Know Me. You know me. I promise I will never stop you in the middle of the street and say, here I am. I am she who has invaded your dreams. I am she whom you secretly adore. I promise I will never identify myself in any obvious way. I will never embarrass you in public. But you know me, sir, and you know that I know that you know that I know that you know me. My God, the nights we have spent together. My God, the times we have had together. Each one of us alone in the unblind darkness, beloved. Thank you very much. storyteller and a multidisciplinary artist. She's been published in a couple of places and written in a few collections, but she takes more pride in the community that she has built with the things, than the things that she has produced. She's the founder and co-editor of the nationwide publication from the Root Zine. She also created the successful workshop series entitled Writing While Black, an initiative to develop a community of black writers which is presently on tour, traveling to audiences in Montreal, New York, Pittsburgh, Ottawa, Detroit, and Halifax. Please welcome Whitney. the fact that they had the entire world to be brave for when 
Shawnee and Dee died their sweet little girl, wrapped in burlap. A bright, burning star stretched out into the ocean. Only then would she allow him to touch her again. Only then would her stone face fall. Eyes were allowed to well, and tears were allowed to tumble in release. Shawnee Dee would have loved to see them together again. But they picked up past conversations, frozen fights, almost a decade old, ignoring each other's needs and needing always to be right. Marriage, separation, remarriage, second separation. There was an affair or two. There was a fire. She threw a match into a pile of his collection, books upon books, drenched in gasoline. Each page burned bright, burned mean in rage. He changed anger over the flames. Stories from the written page are now extinct, irreplaceable. His fortune cracking in a fiery blaze. Yet he loved her revenge. She knew this as truth. And he, he loved her right passion. Each breath that she drew was a deliberate dedication to that love they once knew, that way back love. Did she always have the words for me? He thought, as the word soul made surface from the safe keeps of his mind, maybe her mouth simply moved that way, moved that way, moved that way just for me. One kiss in the back of the neck would summon that way back love and would drop to his knees and kiss her knuckles feverishly. That way back love when she would slip her head across his chest with a silken touch. One kiss on the back of the neck would wash away the infidelity, the manipulation, the responsibility, the humiliation, the unsavory secrets and other complications. The lies upon lies, the jabs upon jabs, the bitter, Bloom sweet with one kiss. But when the strong winds cut deep, she flew away from his love. When the iron caught hold of his tongue and her dignity flung across the other side of the room, she flew away from his love with just one wing marriage, separation, remarriage, second separation. The last poem is a little fresh. <laughs> Define breakup. Fatigue flushes through the body like the memory of disease. An old friend crawls into bed with you, her cold feet shock the system. Heartache. Fatigue but no rest. She swings in a waking nightmare, the soil surrounding your soul loosens. Its moisture in these temperatures falls and it's dry and it's white between the sheets sleeping with heartbreak. Did you break up? They'll ask you the next morning as if you have something unfixable inside and you decide in the darkness of the room in the intimacy of a missed touch that you will always reply we came to the end of our story. Thank you very much. Uh, marvelous once again uh, to be reminded of the uh, griefs and joys, the uh, uh, Genesis and Revelations, the Alpha and Omega of L-O-V-E, uh, what keeps Michelle and Barack humming, <laughs> what does not do anything for Mr. Delirium Tremens. I'm not gonna talk about uh, his actual name, Mr. DT. I'll just say Mr. Delirium Tremens. 
<laughs> and someone else suggested that if it was only if his middle name is D, we might want to call him Mr. DDT. <laughs> which would make perfect sense. I know. I can sense the presence of the devil, even, even this far north. The presence of the devil, even this far north. I hope he's not allowed to cross the border given some of the hate speech that that man has enunciated. <laughs> On words, sweetness and light. More sweetness, more light. It is my great pleasure to introduce to us honey. 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 You know that? A singer, songwriter, voice teacher, poet, a full member of the League of Canadian Poets, 2015 member of the year of the Ontario Poetry Society, Sanguine, or I should say Sanguine Encounters with Greatness 2016 was published for the Spring Pulse Poetry Festival of Cobalt, Ontario. Please visit www.honeynovick.com Without any further ado, honey! <laughs> I'm sure many people 
people in this room that knew Milton. I, uh, when I got out of high school, I worked at the Toronto Workshop Productions Theatre, where the director, George Luscombe, was best friends with Milton. And he would come to, Milton would come to the theatre, and after the performances, we would go for a beer. And that's how I met Milton Acorn which is a whole other story that I'm not going to get into in this moment. But fast forward several years, I had the privilege of being commissioned by the Milton Acorn Festival in Prince Edward Island to write music to some of his poems. And this is one of them. And if you want, you can join me. It's got a nice little beat. It's called Proposal for Realistic Existentialism. Words Milton. Music, not Milton. It all comes in the package, unlike a commodity on me. Unique, and you don't have to like me. I'm serious. Everything I do is an assertion of what I am. And if I bewilder you, it's because I vary. Nevertheless, I'm a gift. Offered with no conditions to you, since I can well exist, you do do. <laughs> Often, so you'll get your chance. 
Thank mm-hmm. you.